History of Christianity and Damp, Shift from Monotheism to Trinity Part 2. In this article, we will spotlight the early monotheistic Christian denominations. We do not mean by monotheistic that all of those denominations believed in pure monotheism just as Muslims do, but that they were generally closer to monotheism and farther away from the Trinity. The Early Monotheistic Christian Denominations Ebionitism. There were monotheistic Christian denominations since of the dawn of Christianity. It is a Jewish Christian movement that existed during the early centuries of the Christian era. They regarded Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah while rejecting his divinity and insisted on the necessity of following Jewish law and rites. The Ebion Knights used only one of the Jewish Gospels, revered James the Just, and rejected Paul the Apostle as an apostate from the law. There is possible reference to Ebionite communities, existing sometime around the 11th century, in northwestern Arabia, in Sefer Hamasayot, the book of the travels of Rabbi Benjamin of Tudela, a rabbi from Spain. These communities were located in two cities, Tamar and Tilmas, possibly Sada in Yemen. The majority of church fathers agreed that the Ebionites rejected many of the precepts central to Nicene Orthodoxy, such as Jesus' pre-existence, divinity, and atoning death. The Ebion Knights are described as emphasizing the oneness of God and the humanity of Jesus, who by virtue of his righteousness was chosen by God to be the messianic prophet like Moses, foretold in Deuteronomy 18:14, 22, when he was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Paulianism. It is a third-century belief concerning the nature of Christ, denying his divinity by asserting that he was inspired by God and was not a person in the Trinity. It is ascribed to Paul of Samosata who denied a distinction of persons in God and maintained that Christ was a mere man raised above other men by the indwelling Logos. Monarchianism. Monarchianism is a set of beliefs that emphasize God as being one person, in direct contrast to Trinitarianism which defines God as three persons coexisting consubstantially as one in being. Various models of resolving the relationship between God the Father and the Son of God were proposed in the second century but later rejected in favor of the doctrine of the Trinity as expounded at the First Council of Constantinople, which confirmed the concept of God as one being consisting of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Two models of monarchianism have been propounded. Modalism, or modalistic monarchianism, considers God to be one person appearing and working in the different modes of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The chief proponent of modalism was Sibelius, hence the view is commonly called Sibelianism. It has also been rhetorically labeled patripassionism by its opponents, because according to the myth purports that the person of God the Heavenly Father suffered on the cross. Dynamic monarchianism holds that God is one being, above all else, wholly indivisible, and of one nature. It reconciles the problem of the Trinity, or at least Jesus, by holding that the Son was not co-eternal with the Father. Arianism Arianism in Christianity is the Christological, concerning the doctrine of Christ, position that Jesus, as the Son of God, was created by God. It was proposed early in the 4th century by the Alexandrian presbyter Arius and was popular throughout much of the Eastern and Western Roman empires. Even after it was denounced as a heresy by the Council of Nicaea, 325. Arianism is often considered to be a form of Unitarian theology in that it stresses God's unity at the expense of the notion of the Trinity. The doctrine that three distinct persons are united in one Godhead. Arius' basic premise was the uniqueness of God, who is alone self-existent, not dependent for its existence on anything else, and immutable. The Son, who is not self-existent, cannot therefore be the self-existent and immutable God. Because the Godhead is unique, it cannot be shared or communicated. Because the Godhead is immutable, the Son, who is mutable, must, therefore, be deemed a creature who has been called into existence out of nothing and has had a beginning. Moreover, the Son can have no direct knowledge of the Father, since the Son is finite and of a different order of existence. The Council of Nicaea, which condemned Arius as a heretic and issued a creed to safeguard Orthodox Christian belief, was convened to settle the controversy. The creed adopted at Nicaea states that the Son is homo usion to patri, of one substance with the Father, thus declaring him to be all that the Father is, he is completely divine. In fact, however, this was only the beginning of a long protracted dispute.
In this article, I will spotlight the most prominent Christians who embraced Islam in Prophet Muhammad's lifetime. We may wonder, could those people have been believers in the Trinity or such monotheists who embraced Islam as a final monotheistic message which came as an extension to the previous monotheistic messages conveyed by the past prophets and messengers of God? Monotheistic Christians and Amp, Profession of Islam upon the advent of Prophet Muhammad. An Najashi, Negus, the Mosque of An Najashi, Negus, in Ethiopia. An Najashi was the title of the King of Abyssinia. One Najashi, namely Azhamar ibn Abjar, who was contemporary with Prophet Muhammad embraced Islam, became a good Muslim and was counted as a grand companion of Prophet Muhammad though he did not migrate to Medina or even meet Prophet Muhammad. He died during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad who offered funeral prayer for him in absentia. It is not reported that Prophet Muhammad offered funeral prayer for an absent deceased except a Najashi. In Sir Alam and Nubala, Ad the Harbi reported that when Amr ibn al and Abdullah ibn Abi Rabia, or Imar ibn al Walid, asked a Najashi to extradite the companions who migrated to Abyssinia. The following conversation took place between a Najashi and the grand companion Jafar ibn Abi Talib. And Najashi wondered, Do you memorize some revelation he, Prophet Muhammad, received from God? Jafar replied, Yes. And Najashi said, Read it to me. Then Jafar read to him the opening verses of the chapter of Maryam, Mary. Thereupon, An Najashi kept crying until he moistened his beard, and his bishops also kept crying until they moistened their scriptures. Then, An Najashi said, Indeed, this, Quran, and the revelation conveyed by Moses get out of the same lantern. Go where you like, by God, I will not, and even may not extradite you. On the next day, at Ahmed ibn Allah's request, An Najashi summoned the companions and wondered, What do you believe about Jesus? Jafar replied, We have the same belief which our Prophet affirmed. We believe that he is God's servant, messenger, spirit, and word which he communicated to Mary, the Virgin. Then, An Najashi struck the ground, picked up a rod, and said, Jesus did not come out with as much as this rod more than what you said. Then, patriarchs around him kept snorting. Then, he said, even though you snort, by God, go where you like, you are safe in my land. Ibn Ishaq reported, Jafar ibn Muhammad quoted his father as saying, the Abyssinians rebelled and revolted against an Najashi whom they accused of the renunciation of their faith. So he prepared ships for Jafar and his comrades and told them, board the ships. If I am defeated, go away. If I clinch victory, stay here. Then, he had a piece of writing in which he bore witness that there is no God but God, Muhammad is God's servant and messenger and Jesus is God's servant, messenger, spirit and word which he communicated to Mary. Then, he kept this piece of writing in his garment. Thereupon, he went out to the Abyssinians who lined up for him. Then he wondered, O people of Abyssinia, am I not the worthiest one to rule over you? They said, Yes. He asked, How have you found my rule? They answered, It is the best rule. Then, he asked, So what is wrong with you? They replied, You have renounced our faith, alleging that Jesus is just a servant, of God. Then, he asked, What do you believe about Jesus? They replied, He is the Son of God. Then he made a signal at his chest towards the piece of writing, indicating his belief in the piece of writing. But, the Abyssinians thought that he meant by this signal that he agreed with them. Then, they became pleased with him and dispersed. When An Najashi died, Prophet Muhammad offered funeral prayer for him and prayed to God for his forgiveness. Heracle, Heraclius. Prophet Muhammad's letter to Heracle, Heraclius. Al Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Imam Ahmad. And other hadith compilers reported on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas that Prophet Muhammad wrote to Caesar and invited him to Islam. When the letter of Prophet Muhammad reached Caesar, he said after reading it, Seek for me any one of his people, Arabs from Kurish tribe, if present here, in order to ask him about Muhammad. At that time, Abu Sufyan ibn Hab was in the Levant with some men from Kurish who had come to the Levant as merchants. Abu Sufyan said, Caesar's messenger found us somewhere in the Levant so he took me and my companions to Jerusalem and we were admitted into Caesar's court. Heracle kept asking Abu Sufyan about Prophet Muhammad and Abu Sufyan kept answering his questions. Then, Heracle said to Abu Sufyan, These are really the qualities of a prophet who, I knew, from the previous scriptures, would appear, but I did not know that he would be from amongst you. 
If what you say should be true, he will very soon occupy the earth under my feet, and if I knew that I would reach him definitely, I would go immediately to meet him. And were I with him, then I would certainly wash his feet. Abu Sufyan added, Caesar then asked for the letter of the messenger of God and it was read. It read, In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, this letter is, from Muhammad, the servant and messenger of God to Heraclius, the Roman emperor. Peace be upon the followers of guidance. Now then, I invite you to Islam, so embrace Islam and you will be safe, embrace Islam and God will bestow on you a double reward. But if you reject this invitation of Islam, you shall be responsible for misguiding the peasants, i.e. your nation. O people of the scriptures, come to a word common to us and you, that we worship none but God, and that we associate nothing in worship with him, and that none of us shall take others as lords besides God. Then if they turn away, say, Bear witness that we are they who have surrendered, unto him, 364. Abu Sufyan added, When Heraclius had finished reading, there was a great hue and cry caused by the Byzantine royalties surrounding him. And there was so much noise that I did not understand what they said. So, we were turned out of the court. When I went out with my companions and we were alone, I said to them, Verily, Ibn Abi Qabshas, i.e. the prophets, a fair has gained power. This is the king of Bani Ali's far fearing him. Abu Sufyan added, By Allah, I remained low and was sure that his religion would be victorious till God converted me to Islam, though I disliked it. Al-Mundhir ibn Sawah. Prophet Muhammad's letter to Al-Mundhir ibn Sawah. Al-Mundhir ibn Sawah was the king of the Persian Gulf during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad. He was a Christian as his people, namely Obad Shams, were Christians. Prophet Muhammad wrote him a letter in which he invited him to Islam. Then, Al-Mundhir embraced Islam but he was not a member of the delegation who attended from Bahrain to meet Prophet Muhammad. Instead, he wrote Prophet Muhammad a letter affirming his profession of Islam. Al-Mundhir's letter to Prophet Muhammad read, O Messenger of God, I read your letter, which you wrote to the people of Bahrain extending to them an invitation to Islam. Islam appealed to some of them and they entered the fold of Islam, while others did not find it appealing. In my country, there live Majans and Jews, therefore, you may inform me of the treatment to be extended to them. In reply to Al-Mundhir's letter, Prophet Muhammad wrote, In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, this letter is, from Muhammad, the messenger of God to Al-Mundhir ibn Sawah. May peace be on you. I praise God, who is one and there is none to be worshipped except him. I bear witness that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is a servant and messenger of God. Thereafter I remind you of God. Whoever accepts admonition does it for his own good. Whoever followed my messengers and acted in accordance with their guidance, he, in fact, accepted my advice. My messengers have highly praised your behavior. I authorize you to deal with your people. So let Muslims follow Islam. I forgive the offenses of the offenders. Therefore, you may also forgive them. Whoever wants to continue in their Jewish or Magian faith should be made to pay tribute. Waraka ibn Nawfal. Waraka ibn Nawfal was the cousin of Prophet Muhammad's first wife, Lady Khadija, the mother of the believers. He was a Christian before Prophet Muhammad's prophethood, but he embraced Islam at the outset of Prophet Muhammad's prophethood. In his Sahih, under the chapter of the outset of Revelation, Al Bukhari reported on the authority of Aisha that Khadija accompanied Prophet Muhammad to her cousin Waraka ibn Nawfal ibn Asad ibn Abdul Uzar, who, during the pre Islamic period, became a Christian and used to write writings with Hebrew letters. He would write from the Gospel in Hebrew as much as God wished him to write. He was an old man and had lost his eyesight. Khadija said to Waraka, Listen to the story of your nephew, O my cousin. Waraka asked, O my nephew, What have you seen? The Messenger of God described whatever he had seen. Waraka said, This is the same one who keeps the secrets, Angel Gabriel, whom God had sent to Moses. I wish I were young and could live up to the time when your people would drive you out. The Messenger of God asked, Will they drive me out? Waraka replied in the affirmative and said, Anyone who came out with something similar to what you will come out with was treated with hostility. And if I should remain alive till the day when you will be driven out, then I would support you strongly. But after a few days Waraka died. It is noteworthy that Waraka ibn Nawfal was the first person to bring Lady Khadija glad tidings about Prophet Muhammad's prophethood after she had told him about what happened during Prophet.
Muhammad's journey with her slave Maysara along with her caravan traveling to the Levant, especially the cloud which was shading him until he came back to Mecca. It is reported that he said to her, If this is true, O Khadija, Muhammad will be the prophet of this nation. I have known that this nation waits for a prophet who is about to appear. Arod al Anuf, Volume 2, p. 161. About one month later, Lady Khadija married the Messenger of God. Waraka composed a poem apparently after this conversation, given the mention of Prophet Muhammad's journey with Khadija's caravan. The glad tidings about Prophet Muhammad's prophethood and the promise to follow him. In his Maznad, Atalisi reported that Waraka ibn Nawfal and Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nifal went out in quest of the true religion. So they went to a monk at Mosul. The monk said to Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nifal, Where have you come from, O camel rider? He replied, From Abraham's household. The monk wondered, What do you seek after? He replied, I seek after the true religion, he said to him, come back for the one you seek after is about to appear at your homeland. Nestorian monk, Bahira. At Termi and Al Hakim reported on the authority of Abu Bakr ibn Abu Musa al Ashari on the authority of his father that Abu Talib traveled to the Levant, and the Prophet left with him along with some older men from Karawish. When they came across the monk they stopped there and began setting up their camp, and the monk came out to them. Before that they used to pass by him and he wouldn't come out nor pay attention to them. They were setting up their camp when the monk was walking amidst them, until he came and took the hand of the messenger of Allah. Then he said, This is the master of men and jinn, this is the messenger of the Lord of the worlds. God will send him as mercy to men and jinn. So some of the older people from Kurush said, How do you know that? He said. When you came along from the road, neither a rock nor a tree was left, except that it prostrated, and they do not prostrate except for a prophet. And I can recognize him by the seal of prophethood which is below his shoulder blade, like an apple. Then he went back, and made them some food, and when he brought it to them, he, Prophet Muhammad, was tending camels. So he said, Summon him. So he came, and there was a cloud over him that was shading him. When he came close to the people, he found that they had sat down under the tree's shade before he came. So when he sat down, the shade of the tree leaned towards him. He, the monk, said, Look at the shade of the tree leaning towards him. While he was standing with them, telling them not to take him to the Romans, because if the Romans were to see him, they would recognize him by description, and they would kill him, he turned, and there were seven people who had come from among the Romans. So he received them and said, Why have you come? They said, We came because a prophet is going to appear during this month, and there isn't a road left except that people have been sent to it, and we have been informed of him, and we have been sent to this road of yours. So he said, Is there anyone better than you behind you? They said, We only have news of him from this road of yours. He said, do you think that if there is a matter which God wishes to bring about, there is anyone among people who can prevent it? They said, No. So they gave him their pledge, and they stayed with him. And he said, I ask you by God, which of you is his guardian? They said, Abu Talib. So he kept adjuring him until Abu Talib returned him, back to Mecca. Salman al-Farisi in his Musnad, Imam Ahmad reported on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas that Salman al-Farisi had a long conversation with him, in which he said, I was a Persian man. I strove hard in the Magian religion. I passed by one of the Christian churches, where I could hear their voices as they were praying. When I saw them, I was impressed with their prayer. I said to them, Where did this religion originate? They said, In the Levant. I sent word to the Christians saying, If any Christian merchants come to you from the Levant, tell me about them. He said, Some Christian merchants came to them from the Levant. And I went out with them, until I came to the Levant. Salman kept serving monks, one after another, from the Levant through Mosul and Nusaiban to Amorium. When the monk of Amorium was about to die, and Salman asked him to tell him about the next monk to serve, he said to him, O oh my son, by God, I do not know of anyone who follows our way to whom I can advise you to go. But there has come the time of a prophet, who will be sent with the religion of Abraham. He will appear in the land of the Arabs and will migrate to a land between two haras, lands with black rocks, between which there are palm trees.
He will have characteristics that will not be hidden. He will eat of what is given as a gift but he will not eat of what is given as charity. Between his shoulder blades is the seal of prophethood. If you can go to that land then do so. Then, Salmon traveled to Arabia and stayed in Medina. When he knew that the people of Medina were gathering in Cuba to receive a man whom they believed to be a prophet, he went to him. Salmon said, I had something that I had collected, and when evening came, I went to the messenger of God when he was in Cuba, and I entered to him and said to him, I have heard that you are a righteous man and that you have companions who are strangers and are in need. This is something that I have to give in charity, and I see that you are more in need of it than anyone else. I brought it near to him and the messenger of God said to his companions, Eat, but he refrained from eating. I said to myself, This is one. Then I went away and collected some more. The messenger of God settled in Medina, then I came to him and said, I see that you do not eat, food given in, charity. This is a gift with which I wish to honor you. The messenger of God then ate some of it and told his companions to eat too. I said to myself, This is two. Then I came to the messenger of God when he was in Biki al Gakhad, where he had attended the funeral of one of his companions and he was wearing two shawls and was sitting down among his companions. I greeted him, then I moved behind him, trying to look at his back to see the seal that my companion had described to me. When the messenger of God saw me going behind him, he realized that I was trying to ascertain something that had been described to me, so he let his garment drop from his back. And I saw the seal and recognized it. Then I embraced and kissed him, while weeping. Then, Salman embraced Islam and became a good Muslim.